in here, but I tell you what, God has just been, this weekend, been stirring something in me. I'm, I am just, I'm fired up to bring this message this morning. We need to pray, though. Let, can we just stop and pray for one second? Heavenly Father, God, I know that you have something powerful that you want to do this morning. And so, Lord, I ask right now, as we take some time in your word, open up our hearts to hear your truth. God, open up our hearts and our spirits, God, to know what you are, what you are up to. And, Father, to be obedient to what you're speaking to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to spend most of our time looking at the lives of Peter and John and this uh, a particular event that happens in their life. And it's, a, it's an event that is, at, one of the, is at the crux of one of the most powerful outpourings of God's presence that's recorded in all of Scripture. And it's an outpouring that actually our city desperately needs. But before I get into that, can I just ask, and, and please feel free to be responsive here. Do we, do we understand our nation needs an outpouring of God's presence? How many know that that's true? Okay. How many know that beyond that, the state of Minnesota needs an outpouring of God's presence. The city and the greater region of St. Cloud needs an outpouring of God's presence. Our neighborhoods and our families need an outpouring of God. How many know a family? You can think of a family that you think, God, you just need to get a hold of that family and just absolutely transform and change them by the power of your presence. You, you know a family like that. I know quite a few, okay? We need God to show up in our nation. And I want to tell you, there's a move of God coming. There is a move of God that is coming. And when it gets here, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, every, all the 17 auditoriums in this complex will not contain the move of God when it shows up. When God starts moving and he starts turning this city around with lasting effect. Acts chapter 3 says this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at them, at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Let, me, let me set this up for you. Here's Peter and John. They're, as we've just read, they're coming into the temple to pray. They're going to, you know, to seek the Lord. And as they come in, uh, they, they come across this guy. And, and as we look at the timing of this, we don't know exactly you know, when this happened. But we know it's, it's Acts chapter 3, so it's just after Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, if you recall, this is where the, the day of Pentecost has taken place. 3,000 have been added to the church kind of just the start of the church. Peter preaches this powerful message. The, the people are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's this awesome, awesome encounter with God's presence. And now, Acts chapter 3 is sometime after that. We don't know if it's a, a, a week, a month, several months. We don't know exactly how long, but sometime after Acts chapter 2, we get to Acts chapter 3. And so here's Peter and John. They're going in, and as they're, they're going in, they encounter this guy. And as they encounter this guy, the Bible begins to describe him. And the description that the Bible gives of this guy is, as we just read, that he is a lame man. He's been lame since birth. Now, later on, we're going to read, as we get to the end of this account, that he was over 40 years old. How many know that's a long time? 40 years is a long time to walk around or to exist in a, in a state of brokenness. 40 years is a long time to have that handicap be the defining characteristic of his life. It's all he's ever known. And so without any way to get around, this man has now been resigned to being carried on a daily basis to places like the Temple Gate that are, are you know, a lot of people, high foot traffic area, and, and they set him down there, and he's resigned to begging for money so that he can live. Imagine this guy. Get this guy in your mind with me. Legitimately, he has lived his entire life with pain. Legitimately, his entire existence has been defined by handicap. His entire life can probably be summed up by that word inability. 
Not what he can do, but what he can't do. And perhaps, worst of all, he has no hope of change. No hope. There's no, there's no doctor that can help him. There's no technology that can even ease his condition a little bit. This guy has no hope. And he's come to the point, as we kind of pick up in verses 4 and 5, he's come to the point, he can't even really look into the eyes of those he's asking for money from anymore. Because, remember, we just read, Peter said, look at, look at us. And that kind of indicates that he's, you know, here's this guy. I mean, can you picture him? He's there, he's begging. He's, he can't even really look up. Why? Probably because he's been rejected so many times. As he's watched the feet of people passing him by time and time again with too few clinks of a nickel in his little cup, the rejection is set in. He's become hardened, perhaps, to hope. And so here is this man. Yet what can he do? He's got to eat somehow, and so he's resigned to begging there at the temple gate. Can you imagine the weight of the miserable existence that's been growing upon this man day after day, year after year, devoid of all hope. I want to ask you this morning a, a couple, I'm going to ask you a series of some very pointed questions, okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to warn you right now, you might get your feathers a little ruffled today, okay? Is that okay? Do I have permission to ruffle some feathers this morning? Okay, I'll take that as yes, okay? Some, some pointed questions. This one's not the most pointed one, though, so I'll, I'll ask it. Who are the beggars in our lives? Who are, the, who are the men like this? Look past the physical description. I understand probably not a lot of us have actual physical beggars in our lives. Who are the people that, like this man, are devoid of hope? Who are the people that are like this man in that they have known nothing but, but brokenness? They've known nothing but pain, or, or for as long as they can remember, that's all they've known. Who are those people in our lives? Who are those, those people? Is it, is it your, uh, your coworker who has shared with you the, the breakdown of their marriage? Their marriage isn't working. In fact, it never really did. And they're devoid of hope. Is it your neighbor that, that you, you, you talk to them and you sense the fear in them as the reports have come in from the doctor, as the pain has increased and not decreased in their physical condition? They don't really know what's going on and there's that fear and they have no hope. Is it the family member that you see maybe only twice or three times a year at a family holiday gathering of, of some kind, and, and yet in those instances you found out the finances are tough. There's more bills than there is money, and they've got no hope. Is it that, that person that we're going to see at the fair? I, see, here, here's my thought. These people, this beggar, this guy that we've just described, he's all over our city. He is all over. Our, we don't have to look that hard to find this guy. He's all, we're going to see him at the fair this week. We're going to see him in the form of 30-year-old of single moms. We're going to see him in the form of 45-year-old of depressed men who are in the middle of a midlife crisis. We're going to see him in the form of 21-year-old college students that are, are absolutely directionless in life. We're going to see them in the form of 65-year-old grandparents who can barely pick up their grandbaby without wincing in pain because the arthritis has set in so bad. We're going to see him in the form of, of little kids that are going to come to our booth, and, and those kids are tired of mom and dad arguing and fighting every day. We're going to see him in the form of teenagers that have already bought into the world's message of, of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We're going to see him all week long at the booth, and you know these people too. This guy that we've just described, he's all over our city. As I was preparing this message, I kept getting stuck on verse 4, though. Verse 4 is actually kind of what sets Peter and John apart from the rest of the people. Verse 4 is where Peter, it says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. The King James Version says that they fastened their eyes on him. You know what Peter and John did? They put their agenda aside, didn't they? See, they had some place to be. They were on their way to prayer. It wasn't that they weren't going somewhere or weren't busy. They had stuff to do and places to be. They set their agenda aside. And so I asked myself, and here's another one of those harder questions. Would I have stopped? Would I have been too busy to stop? Would you have been 
too busy to stop. Are we too busy to stop? Let's be honest. Stopping is more inconvenient than just, just going. It would be easier to keep walking. Just keep going and, and like all of the other people, just turn a blind eye. Yeah, I see that guy there, but I'm going to pretend like I didn't. It would have been easier to do. It would have been easier for them to take a couple of little nickels out and throw them in his cup and, and, and pay for his dinner and just keep going and head on to prayer. That would have been easier for Peter and John. But Peter and John had a sense that there was a divine appointment. I wonder, friends, how many times have we been guilty of turning the blind eye? How many times have we looked right past those people in our lives that God has set us up with with those divine appointments, and yet we've used the excuse, too busy. Now's not a convenient time. This is going to require too much of my time or my resources. They're probably going to ask me for money, and I don't really want to give them money. How many times have we, have we excused ourselves from interview, uh, intervening because maybe we even assumed they're not going to really want to hear the words that I have to say? They're not going to want to hear the message of hope that I have to give. And so we excuse ourselves, we let ourselves off the hook, and we keep going. And meanwhile, that person's situation doesn't change. God has called us to be people who do stop. Can I tell you that? He's called us to be the people that do stop. Colossians 3.2 says this. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We're called to be a compassionate people. A compassionate people. And part of what compassion does is compassion identifies that hurt in another person's life. And, and that, man, your heart just yearns. It breaks for them. Your heart desperately wants to do something and see something changed within them. Jesus addresses this topic as well in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Verse 34, he says this. He says, he's telling this parable, and he says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or, or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I want you to understand something. According to Jesus, according to Jesus, as his followers, we're to be clothed in compassion. We're to be those who stop. We're to be those who extend the cup of cold water to the one who needs the, the drink. We're to be those that go to those that are hurting and broken, to the sick, to the one that's locked up in prison, to the, to the one that's hungry, to the one that's in need of shelter. We're to be those people. And Jesus says that when you've done that, when you've gone to them, when you've, when you've ministered to them, when you've when you've extended hope to them, when you've gone to the, to the person whose marriage is struggling, when you've gone to the person who's dealing with addiction, when you've gone to the, to the kid who's been abused, when you go to people in these hurting conditions and you minister hope, it's as though you are doing it to me. And, and the reward is this. Come on in. Come on in. Enter the kingdom. Enter the kingdom that's been prepared for you, your awesome inheritance. He goes on to say, right after that, he describes the goats. That's the sheep first that he described. Now the goats, the goats are on the left. You know what he says? And I'm not going to take the time to read it, but he says to the goats, I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything. I was hungry and you didn't do anything. I was sick. You didn't come to visit. I needed shelter and you didn't welcome me in. And to the goats, it's, it's Jesus' fateful words that says, depart from me. I don't know you. I don't have any fellowship with you. Depart from me. I don't know you. And he sends them away. Church, that ought to strike to our heart. That ought to give some new perspective to this. Lord, am I 
the type of person that better fits the description of the sheep or the goats. Lord, I want to be a sheep. I want to be the kind of man that that stops when you've called me to stop. I want to walk in obedience to what you've called me to do. As Christ followers, our lives are no longer our own. We've given them to God, and that includes our time, that includes our energy, that includes our, our, our money, that includes our possessions. I'm going to give these things over to you. If you want to use them, you can have them. Are we really going to be able to stand before God Almighty one day and stand there and say, well, God, I'm sorry I didn't take the time to help this person, but, you know, I was really busy. It was kind of inconvenient, God. I mean, just saying that sounds flimsy even now to say that. Sorry, God, it was going to cost me too much to do that. No, listen, I want to walk in obedience to your calling, God, and if you've given me an opportunity to reach this world somehow, to, to, to pass on hope somehow, then I want to do it as the Holy Spirit stirs within me. Watch what happens next with Peter and John. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Wow. I know probably most of us have read this, and so the shock value is not there, but put yourself there. Put yourself in that setting, observing this. Wow. This guy, 40 years broken, lifted up off the ground, and now he can walk again. How cool would that be to see? How exciting what would that do if something like that happened here today? And there'd be a lot more woohoo and going on, I'll tell you that much right now. We'd be fired up to see something like that. What a scene. And so I read that this week, and here was the, the toughest question. And to be honest, this one might be downright offensive. I'm just going to tell you, it might be downright offensive. I asked myself, would it have even made a difference if I did stop? Would it even make a difference if I did stop? If this scenario were presented to me and this man were placed in my path and I came walking by and I actually took the time to stop, is there enough of God's presence in my life that it would have even made a difference? Or would I have been that person that shook his hand, gave him a few nickels, said, God bless you, my brother. I hope you have a great existence. And on I go, and there he sits, unchanged. Now, you say, well, Pastor Ryan, I mean, come on. I do some good things. Listen, I know there's some people in this room, and this is where I say it could be kind of offensive, because I know that there's some people in this room, a lot of people in this room, that you're high, high, high quality people. You do lots of awesome things. You're great at coming along alongside somebody and giving them a word of encouragement. That's awesome. Keep doing that. We need people to do that. You're great at stopping when somebody has a need and helping to meet that need. Maybe you've from time to time pulled five bucks out of your pocket and given it to somebody and said, here, have some lunch. That's great. I'm not, I'm not downplaying the importance of those kinds of things. But how many know that this guy right now, if you give him five bucks and say, head up to Subway and buy a sandwich, that's not going to change his life. How many know that that's true? This guy needs something more, something bigger. And so I've got to ask myself the question. You go ahead and ask yourself, okay? If I had stopped, would this guy's life have even changed? And I got to, in a moment of transparency, I got to be honest with you this morning. For me, the answer is no. And I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. I look at it and I say, no. I got nothing to give this guy. God, I got nothing to give this guy to actually change his life because your power that is available to me in your word is devoid of my life. And I'm not okay with it. Because we live in a city that is filled with, with men and women just like this that are broken. We're going to see them all week long at the fair. 
And if the best thing that I can do is shake their hand and take their picture and make them smile, what have I accomplished? Nothing. If I can give them a water bottle because they came, nothing. But when they come to the doors of this church, there had better be a power at play, a power at work. That's what I'm hungry after. That's what this city is going to need in order to experience revival, is an outpouring of God's presence and his power. And it's going to be people that are filled with his presence, like Peter and John, that are willing, yes, to stop. But when they stop, it's going to actually meet a need and make a difference. Who wants to be one of those kind of people? I want to be that guy. Lord, fill me with your presence to be. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm getting a little bit, woo this morning. If this is your first time, I'm not normally quite this fired up. But you know what? Holy Spirit's, yeehaw, here we go. I want to be that kind of guy. And I'm tired of looking at my life and saying, you know what? Honestly, the power's not there. Honestly, I wouldn't have the courage. That's what it boils down to, I think, for me. I wouldn't have the courage to look at this guy and say, rise up and walk. I might have the courage to say, here's five bucks. But the courage to say, rise up and walk, that takes guts, man. That takes guts. And I look and I wonder, do I have it? God, make me a man of courage. Make me a man of courage. The Apostle Paul understood this. Actually, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus talked about this. Mark chapter 16, when he issued the Great Commission, Jesus said this. He said, these are the signs that will accompany those who believe. How many believe? Okay, right now you say, I'm a believer. Okay, these are the signs that will accompany those who believe. So if your hand just went up, here's, here's what we're looking for, okay? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> In my name, they'll drive out demons. Haven't done that. <laughs> Speak in new tongues, okay, uh, yeah. Pick up snake, I don't recommend doing the whole snake handling thing. That, that has bad results usually, okay. Pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Again, you know, stick to Diet Pop or something, okay. <laughs> They'll place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Amen. That is the signs that accompany those who believe those that are filled with his power. The Apostle Paul understood it too. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he writes this. He says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration. Say that word, with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul says, you know what? I might not be that great of a preacher. I might kind of stumble over my words and stutter out a little bit, but you didn't really care about that because you know what? I backed it up with the Spirit's power, this demonstration of the Spirit's power, and that's exactly what Peter and John display right here, a demonstration of the, of the Spirit's power. Now, I got to preach really fast, but you need to hear this. So, Verse 9, back in Acts chapter 3, when all the people saw him, the man, walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Are you getting this? The undeniable truth of this encounter is this, that when God's power and God's presence shows up, what's the result? The people come what? Running. running. Come running. You know what we were praying? We got this little band of, of faithful prayer warriors. I would love to see that number increase. We meet before service, Theater 11, uh, 845. We pray for 20, 25 minutes together. And our little band of about five prayer warriors this morning, we were praying and believing that like a magnet, God's presence would just reside right here, right here in this place. And that literally, like just cars driving by would just be like, just, just drawn in. Why not? Why not? 
have God's presence so thick and powerful and rich and awesome here. Not because of us, because he's awesome. That he's here and that somebody heading up to Fleet Farm to buy, you know, a pile of lumber, all of a sudden detours in to the theater because they're just compelled. Why not? Why not? Somebody thinks they're heading up to the park diner for eggs and bacon and ends up sitting in church. Why not? God, like a magnet, draw them in. Draw them in. Draw them in. The people come running to this encounter because here's this guy that they've seen for the last 40 years and they've seen his brokenness. They know who he is. They know how, how jacked up this guy's life is. They know that. And all of a sudden, he's walking and jumping and praising God. And they're like, what? We know this guy. We got to come check this out. What's going on? I got to tell you, when you and I start taking up the power that is available to us in Scripture, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we start taking it out to the beggars of the world, like this guy, I'm going to tell you right now, this place will fill up overnight. It will fill up so fast as lives begin to change. You will not, and it's not about filling this place up so that Solid Rock has a big church, mind you. I'm talking about this place will fill up with people whose lives are being transformed and set free and are once on their way to hell and are now spending eternity in heaven. And that's what it's about, okay? This place will fill up when we start taking up the power that's available to us and going out and finding those beggars and saying, hey, let me just help you up here. Let's just change things around a little bit. Let's open up a few blind eyes or, you know what? Hey, let's go find some terminally ill cancer patients and just deal with that or whatever. In Jesus' name, you'll be amazed what happens. You'll be amazed what happens. This building will not contain it. Verse 12. Peter sees this. He says to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? And then over the next 14 verses, he just preaches in power to the people that are there to the point it brings you up to Acts chapter 4. He's just preaching about Jesus and the people are listening. And Acts chapter 4 hits and it says this, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they, they put them in jail until the next day. A little bit inconvenient, okay? You're like doing this thing, and all of a sudden you get thrown in the clink, okay? That's kind of the inconvenient part of stopping. But look at this, verse 4 of Acts chapter 4. This ought to just whoo, stagger you, okay? However... Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. 5,000. Now, I, I looked into this this week. I researched this. And as best I can tell, when you really start to break down the original language of this, okay, this isn't adding on to the 3,000 that were already won in Acts chapter 2. This is 5,000 men. Mind you, not, no women, you don't count, okay? Sorry, in the Bible, they don't count the women. Kids, if you're here, you don't count. We count you here, okay? We'll count you here. But in the Bible, I guess you don't count. So 5,000 men out of the life of one man who is sitting here broken on the side of the road, and they lifted him up, and they healed him in Jesus' name, and 5,000 entered the kingdom that day. That is revival. Think about the church. Think about the church. They didn't have buildings to meet in, and they didn't have billboards, and they didn't have water bottles that they were handing out, and they didn't, certainly didn't set up a booth with a, a you know, picture at the county fair or any of that stuff. And those are all great ideas. God can use those things, and he is using those things. But how many know none of those things that we've done that have you know, been advertising will advertise as well as one lame man getting healed? Revival sparks out of lame men getting healed. Revival will spark. And you know what? Here's where the, the, the title of the sermon comes from. It's the, it's the very next thing that happens. They throw Peter and John in, in prison. They bring them out before the, you know, it's the Sadducees and the, and the teachers of the law and the, the captain of the guard. They bring them out in front of these people the next day. And Peter just starts preaching to these guys. He just starts giving it to them. 
And after he kind of gives it to him, verse four, uh, Acts 4.13 says this. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that they had been with Jesus. They took note. I got to, here's the one last hard question. As the world looks at my life and yours, do they take note that we've been with Jesus? Has ever a greater compliment ever been spoken that they took note that these men had been with Jesus, that their time with Jesus had rubbed off on them so well and now it was flowing out of them in such a power, in such a proportion that the men that were there, they said, look at these guys. You know what, you know what ordinary unschool basically is? These guys are kind of dumb, <laughs> okay? They're not, very, they're not the sharpest cookie, you know? I mean, come on. And yet, look at what they're doing. They're fishermen. They're fishermen. They're like the, the bottom rung of society. And yet, they've been with Jesus. We can tell they've been with Jesus. These guys are, are doing something that is extraordinary. Have they taken note that you and I have been with Jesus? I, I, hope, that, I hope that they have. I hope that they will. As the band comes, and starts to play. I want to share as sort of a last thing this morning. This this, uh, isn't just something that's found in the Bible. There's some historical evidence since Scripture that things like this have happened. 1857, there's an event, some of you have heard of it, it's called the Great Awakening. Started with three men. Three men. And here's a little excerpt from that move of God. Three men praying for revival, meeting in a Dutch Reformed church in New York. And it says, first there were three men praying in earnest at daily prayer meeting. Then there were five. Then a week later, 14. Then 23 uncompromising men who would not let go of the old-time religion, who raised their voices to God. Soon... Every public building in downtown New York was filled for noontime prayer meetings. How would you like it if this started to happen in St. Cloud? In a week's time, 10,000 people were saved. It started with three men. In a week's time, 10,000 people were saved. In eight months, 50,000 of that city were saved. And this revival spread throughout the whole country from New York to Los Angeles. It spread to Ireland, Scotland, England, South Africa, and India. One scholar remarked that the move of God's Spirit across America was so strong that even as the ships came nearing American ports, the people on board felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and were saved and filled with joy before they even reached the harbor. You could reword this to say they were driving to Fleet Farm and the convicting power caused them to pull over to the side of the road and they just took a knee and they got saved before they ever got there. They just felt to come check out Solid Rock or another church because this is not about us. This is going to take more than us. We need this all across the city. Amen? And they begin to to fill in. There was another move of God in the 1940s and 1950s. I hope this just inspires you to see this is real. Okay, this is real. Happened in the small island nation of Hebrides, which is just off the coast of Scotland. It says, before the revival, churches in the area were virtually empty. Many churches were about to close their doors, but there were some who were not ready to give up. Among them was a small group of men who agreed to meet regularly in a barn for prayer. They made a covenant with God, And as they met there, three nights every week until four or five in the morning, one night after the little band of prayer warriors had made their way to the farmhouse to claim the promises of God, John, the local blacksmith, was called upon to pray. As he prayed, the power of God was unleashed, rattled the dishes on the dresser, and then waves of divine power moved through the room. Simultaneously, the Spirit of God swept through the village. 
People could not sleep and houses were lit all night. People walked the streets in great conviction. Others knelt by their bedsides crying for pardon. Within 48 hours, the drinking house, I think that's the bar, usually usually crowded with drinking men of the village, was closed. 14 young men who had been drinking there were gloriously converted. Those same men afterwards could be found three times a week with others down on their knees before God, praying for their old associates and for the spread of revival. Goes on to say, in some districts there was hardly a soul who was not affected by the revival. One man who had very little time for God was driving along the road when he suddenly saw before him a vision of hell. Startled and afraid, he jammed on his brakes, pulled his car to the roadside. Then kneeling down, he surrendered his life to Christ. Literally, people pulling off the road and saying, I don't know what's just hit me. I don't know what's happening, but I've got this conviction. I've got sin in my heart and just begin to get broken before God. Church, that is what we need. This week, as we look, and I'm sorry, this this service is much longer than we normally go, but you're all right. It's a comfy chair. Just lean back a little bit, okay? This week, as we bring the message of Christ to the Benton County Fair, as we prepare for an event, Friends Rock Sunday next next Sunday, I want to encourage you to begin to dream. But beyond that, begin to pray. Begin to seek God. God, would you pour out your presence in our city? God, would you set up divine appointments all week long for those that are working at the fair? God, would you use a little a little photo booth? It's just a fun, gimmicky little thing. Would you use that, Lord, to, to set up divine appointments, to get people to fill this place next Sunday and that when they come, we're going to believe that the Holy Spirit's going to show up in power and in conviction and that they're going to flood these altars ready to give their life to Jesus. Why not now? Begin to believe. Begin to, to take some ownership. Take those three cards. Three cards. Three. Not 30. Three. Okay? And find somebody. Invite them. Do whatever it takes. If you got to go pick them up to get them here, fill this place up. Now, this is not going and finding other people that already have a church and they're already born again. Listen, great. Let them stay at their church. That church needs them. This is like, we're looking for people that need to get born again. Okay? Find those people. And let's see them one to Christ. That's what we need. As the band plays, this is, this is how we're going to attempt to close service. If you have a, a stirring in your heart this morning, a stirring that says, God, we need revival. God, we need revival. We need you to pour out your presence in our land. Then I want you to do this. I want you from where you're at, I want you to stand up to your feet. And can we take some time and let's just seek him together. You know what? Everything I've read would indicate there's a lot to do with seeking God, seeking God, believing God for it. Let's seek his face together. Let's call out to him for a little while together. You may be here. You you know what? Hold on. Before, you you can go ahead and stand, but uh, you know what? I just, I've got to check in my heart right now. Before we do that, you might be here this morning. We're going to give you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus right now. We don't need to wait till next week. If you're here right now, and you're just, you feel the presence of God in a way you've never felt, and you have a sense that it's time to get your life right with God, to get it right with God. And, and what that's going to entail is making a commitment to serve Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, unless a man is born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. John 3.3, 3, unless a man is born again, and you're ready to have that born-again experience and give your life to God. Maybe you see yourself in this man that we describe, broken and devoid of hope, and you're saying, I need help. The answer is Jesus. If that's you, without any delay, I want you to to stand your feet, and I want you to to join me right up here in this altar. We're going to pray, and God is going to save you. He's going to set you free right now. Is there anybody that needs to respond to that call this morning? I just have a check that we need to to first, put first things first. Just going to wait a moment or two. 
I know it's a, it can feel like a long walk, but it's the best walk you're ever going to make. Awesome. Awesome. Let's give it up for this brother right here. Anybody else that you feel compelled to join him? I'm going to ask, actually, Tim. Oh, you're right here. John, could you come and pray with this brother here? I'm going to have John come and pray with you. He's going to lead you in a sinner's prayer. Anybody else you feel compelled, you just go with these guys. That being said, now you're here, and you there's a stirring. There's a stirring. You feel, you feel like, man, God, I want this. I want revival. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to feel free to come. Let's just begin to seek him. Let's begin to find a place. If you want to come to this altar and seek him, if you want to make an altar right where you're at and just seek him, the band is going to play. I don't think we're going to have an official dismissal this morning. Thank you for coming. There's, I'm sure there's a green bucket somewhere you can drop your offering and your connection card if you've got to go. But there's really no rush. But what if we just went after him and began to seek him and begin to believe him for an outpouring of his spirit this morning? Hallelujah. Let's just do that.